Welcome to Believe in 76ers with your host, former 76ers point guard Eric Snow and two Sixers fanatics in Marcus and Tasia Dash. Believe in 76ers is presented by betonline.ag. We're finally here. The top teams in college basketball have been determined and the final four is set. Looking to wager on these games or the national championship? Head over to betonline.ag on your desktop or mobile device to sign up today and receive your 50% welcome bonus on your first deposit. Just use our promo code BELIEVE, that's B-L-E-A-V, to get started. BetOnline remains your number one spot for all updated odds and info, along with player props and new contests throughout the year. It's the best source for all your sporting wagering needs, including live betting and everyone's favorite Vegas casino and poker games. It's super easy to get started. So join today. Learn why everyone is saying Bet Online is the fastest and easiest way to wager on sports. Bet Online, where the game starts. Hey guys, welcome to the Believe in 76ers podcast. I'm Marcus Dash. I'm here with our 70, former 76ers point guard, Eric Snow, and my brother, Tasia Dash. Gentlemen, how you guys doing? Doing good. Doing good. Good, good. So, um, Eric, what were your thoughts on the game last night? I know a lot of people thought UNC had that game pretty easily at, at the way the first half went, but what did you think about Kansas' second half comeback? I mean, they they made some, you know, um, you know, big halves, second halves like that, so you knew it was coming. I think the fact that they jumped out so early in the second half, it pretty much made an even game going down the stretch. And I think with um, Leaky Black getting that early foul trouble, um, the big fella getting injured, um, it just kind of snowballed for North Carolina. They just couldn't quite get over the hump. I think if he stays out and and maybe um, Big Fella doesn't get hurt, I think that they maybe they weather the storm. But it was just a bad combination. And, and Kansas is, was playing well, also made some big plays and big buckets um, in the end. So you have to give them credit as well. You see the footage of that uh, floorboard? Of what's that? Um, Baycott's when he hurt his ankle, the floorboard was loose. You didn't see that? No, I did not. Yeah, they just had a they had a slow mo. Uh, I saw this morning. Uh, you could see it when he steps on it, the floorboard like jiggles a bit, and that's when he turns his ankle. Wow, that's interesting. That is crazy, man. Wow. That's crazy. What bad luck. That. That's crazy. Yeah, ESPN nor Fox Sports talked about this morning, so uh, that, that's interesting. They're trying to keep that under wraps. <laughs> <laughs> Sue them is what he should do. Yeah. Especially if he has like bad like limit ligament damage on that ankle because that's twice in what four days he's done that that same yeah. ankle. Oh, that's, that's, that's unfortunate. That's brutal. Uh, but uh, our guy Joel MB was pretty happy that his uh, Kansas Jayhawks won last night. He was actually tweeting about it. So uh, we'll see. I'm sure. Was... Yeah, <laughs> rightfully so. <laughs> <laughs> there was a lot. There was a lot of Kansas guys in the game last night. So Paul Pierce was there. Mario Chalmers. Um, but yeah, no. Uh, Joel MB was. Uh, the comments gone, and then people were all, like saying, "Oh, well, now it's your turn to win MVP, and then win the uh, win the final." So uh, hopefully that does happen for our sake. But um, yeah, I'll, I'll be happy about those two. I, I don't, I don't really care about Kansas. <laughs> yeah, right yeah. there with you. <laughs> so uh, over the weekend, um, our guys you know, kind of bounced back. We had a little bit, a bit of a losing streak, but our guys kind of bounced back. Um, we tied a franchise record in three point shots made in a win against Charlotte, uh, dominating the game one forty four to one fourteen. Uh, and then we traveled to Cleveland to finish off our sweep of the Cavaliers for the first time. And I believe about 10 years was the last time we swept the Cavaliers um, in a season series, uh, winning 112 to 108. What were your all's um, takeaways from the games this weekend? Well, I mean, I think um, what was most important, I think, is just winning the games. Um, you know, like I said, we're still playing for a seed, but I just think we had to get that rhythm of, of winning some games. Um, you want to, you know, you want a road game. Uh, against a playoff team, you got another team that's fighting for playoff position, and you you beat them, and especially in the second half, you beat them handily. So I think that it was just important to get back on the winning side, um, get a little momentum that way, and I just think that 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 helps helps the morale. It helps kind of build the momentum. I'm um, going into the playoffs, but I, I think you know how they did it. You know, it was pretty impressive making the, the shooting the threes and shot the ball well but then going in there and, and, and getting stops when you need it as well. And, and just overall, the, the way the team played and you didn't really have, you had a lot of chemistry. You had the chemistry that was flowing. You had guys, the ball was moving. They were making shots. I just think for the most part, guys felt good and looked good. 
Yeah, Tasia, what were your takeaways? I know you were talking about Tobias tearing it up on, uh, the, I guess, like Charlotte. What were your takeaways for, for, the, for the whole weekend? Um, not much to say from the Charlotte game other than bombs away. We just couldn't miss. And we've been on the receiving end of that against a few teams. So it was nice to finally beat a team that just couldn't miss a three-pointer all game. Um, it was nice to see us take a lead and keep going with it. I like seeing that rather than just let them come back in the game. Um, we were only up five at halftime, but we ended up com completely pulling away in the second half, which was nice to see. Uh, so I looked it up. We're 37 and 16 when we win the fourth quarter. So that's an interesting stat, I thought. Um, so it was nice to just see us keep dominating and not let up a lead. Um, Cleveland, I, I think we won because partly because Embiid's in the paint defense was out of control. He was all over the place. Um, and our free throws, we, uh, we made four more free throws than they attempted in the game. Um, so I'm not completely shocked by, you know, Bickerstaff's uh, disgruntled comments about the refereeing. I personally didn't see a lot of bad calls, but – what do you expect when you have marking in on Embiid, you know, half the night? That, that's not going to go well for anybody. Um, uh, some negatives. Max, he struggled a bit. He's been struggling a little bit lately. But again, as Eric said a million times, these guys just aren't getting a lot of shots. But you know, he's failed to reach 20 in six of his last games. Um, he has been shooting well from three. And then Tobias struggled offensively. But I love Tobias's defense lately, man. He's been all over the floor. He's been such a versatile defender. He's guarding guys like Levert, and then he's guarding Markinen. Um, I've seen him play against smaller fives. I mean, not that it's a good matchup for him, but he can hold his own against a lot of different kind of players, which is nice to see, and we're going to need that in the playoffs big time. Yeah. Uh, what were uh, what were Bickerstaff's uh, comments after the game on Sunday? I, I, I don't think I caught that. Uh. He said pretty much, I mean, he complained. I don't know if he got fined already, but he's going to be. Um, he basically complained and said, it's not basketball. It's not, it's not fair. They, the refs took this away from us. I don't usually say it, but this time the refs took us away and that uh, Embiid and Harden um, manipulate the rules to go to the foul line a lot. And it just shouldn't be happening. Eric, what, what do you think about that? I mean, I think that, you know, whenever guys take that many free throws, I don't think this is anything new. I mean, coaches complain about free throws has been going on for a while. Um, so that's, that's, you know, as long as my whole career, and I'm sure before me, um, you always had teams that shot more free throws. So, um, to, you know, I've played in games where our team has shot more than the other, you know, made more than the other team have, have attempted and vice versa. Like I've been in those games. And, and the one common thread is the fact that usually when, someone is saying something, they're making a complaint about a team, it's usually some pretty pretty good players or some star players on the other end. <laughs> so that, that's the one common thread is that you have guys that are really good and, get, and really good at getting to the free throw line. So I think it's a combination of those guys um, trying to work the referees to work the system to maybe get those calls the next game. Um, and I think they have a legitimate gripe, but at the same time, we have two guys that are really good and they're really good at getting through the free throw line yeah. and, and their career says it, their career says that they can get to the free throw line. Now you just happen to have them both on the same team. I would have thought it would have been more um, odd if all of a sudden Harden came here and they stopped calling fouls against one or the other, because like you said, their entire career and has gone to the free throw line a lot, his entire career Harden's gone to the free throw line a lot. So just because they're on the same team, doesn't mean you have to call the games differently you call it as it is I mean they get fouled a lot they get fouled a lot and they do and even watching the games I see a lot more of opportunities where MB yeah. gets hit hard or Harden gets hit hard driving to the rim so I you know I'm sure it's frustrating as an opposing fan but they are getting fouled play, I mean move your feet play defense I mean would it that. be an issue if, the, if those fouls were spread amongst other people on the team still fouls yeah. Yeah. I think it brings up, but you're right. I mean, you're right though. I think it brings a larger light when it's like two guys shooting more than our entire team. Yeah. Right. But they also have the ball 90% of the game. Yeah. So that's, that's why. why that's the one thing a referee. I remember Joey Crawford them telling me is like, Hey, you know, the reason why the, the star players get more fouls is because they usually have the ball more. <laughs> yeah. And we establish how ball dominant Harden is. And yeah. we know Embiid. Has the ball in the low post a lot. They don't and get gets, more. I mean, yeah. and like I said, they're good at creating fouls. That that's a skill. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think Harden. 
it's weird because MB he mixes it up. Like he he goes to his foul creating mode on you know the rip throughs and stuff. But then other times he has kind of the shack. It's like I'm gonna bulldoze into your chest uh, under the hoop, and you're gonna have to either foul me to stop me, or you're gonna have to block my shot. So you have two choices. I mean, that's you know, it. it's, it's it's a skill to initiate the contact. Um, still be able to control the ball, still be able to make a move. And you 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 pretty much put the referees in the position to make a call. Um, some people shy away from that. Some people are very forceful with that. I mean, you get a guy like Trey Young who's really good at, you know, getting fouls. And, and, and it's just guys that they just have a knack for it. And we just happen to have two. Yeah. I, I got to say that I wish – I wish Harden played through it a little more. It seems like he really sells the foul and does the whole arm out thing a lot. Yeah. I wish I know you got I know you got contact and you want to sell it, but at the risk of getting a turnover if they don't call it, I'd wish you just like hold on to the ball and try to get a decent shot off instead of just dropping the yeah, ball I mean, sometimes. I, I believe that James probably does more, but Joel does the same thing. Yeah. I mean, I yeah. think they both do it. I mean, they that's so if you're trying to, if you got that knack to get those fouls, you're trying to draw those fouls, you're going to have those cases where they don't call anything. Yeah. Um, that's going to happen if in order for them to continue to get to the line the way they're getting it at that rate, you're going to have some of those instances where they don't, they do not make the call. Unfortunately, more so in the playoffs. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, the issue in the playoffs is going to be more so in the playoffs, but also if those possessions are, are cut down. Um, you got to be careful with it as well. Mm -hmm. Usually in the playoffs, the possessions are, you know, smaller or shorter. Um, smaller, rather, because of, you know, the game, you know, people Tightening aren't taking as quick shot, as many quick shots as they would during the regular season. Yeah. Yeah, I was actually looking at, um, there was a stat I saw last week, because uh, Embiid, on, he was on J.J. Reddick's podcast, and he mentioned that he actually averages more free throws per game in the playoffs than he does in the regular season, so... He, he said people keep talking about it's not going to happen when I get to the playoffs, but I actually average more free throws uh, per game in the in the playoffs than I do. Did he, did he average more minutes? I'm gonna. I think so. I mean, yeah, probably. I, I don't know. Probably. probably. Yeah, I mean that could that could matter that could that could matter. You have more minutes, you can have more possessions, and you know. Yeah, yeah. that's a good point. Well, hopefully that could that that trend continues because we're gonna we're, we're gonna need those uh those uh, free throw attempts. Um, <laughs> Uh, so the next topic, so not only did J.B. Bickerstaff have comments after the game, Joel Embiid also had comments after the game on Sunday. Um, when Joel was asked about uh, what it will mean for him if he doesn't win the MVP, um, he was quoted as saying, if it doesn't happen, I don't know what I have to do. I feel like they hate me. I feel like the standard for guys in Philly or for me is different than everyone else. So Eric, being a former 76ers point guard, do you feel like the national media has a different standard for Philadelphia players or is it just Embiid and him being a part of the process? Well, uh, I'm not sure. I don't think they have a different standard for um, um, Sixers players. I mean, I, I was there when a Sixers player won the MVP. Um, I, I, I just think you have a criteria issue. Um, you have so many different voters that think differently. You see it differently, and there's no set criteria. So, I, I don't have a you know. I'm I, I hope he can win it, but I, I'm not certain. I just think that with you know Giannis and Jokic and Joel, I just think it's going to be a very close race, and those votes are going to split. It's going to come down to who gets the most first place. You may have some people to get first place and get fourth place by someone else. So I just I think it's going to be really really close, and I just think the fact that you got three or four guys that's really, really fighting, you never know how people are rating them. They may like one of them at number one, but who do they like at two? Who do they like at three? Um, or, or do somebody else, you know, jump in that top three? I think it's going to come down to the second place, third place votes as well, getting guys more points. And, and because I don't, I don't, I can't say that one guy is going to dominate the number one vote. I just don't, see how they can do it without a criteria because I've talked to so many people and seen a lot of people and it's like unanimous of how different people see it like I have not had anyone say yes it's a lock that Joel's gonna get it if if anyone was a lock I've heard more people say you know Jokic will get it and I was like oh that's interesting because yeah. at each poll um 
you know, straw vote, it was different each time. It was a different number one each time. So it's just like right now, like what, what is the criteria that, you know, because when Russell Westbrook won the MVP and his team wasn't a top four seed, it was an issue because of where his team was ranked. But now it's not an issue where a team is ranked. You know, it's just like, just wondering, like, what is it all about? Yeah. Because, you know, you say stats and stats matter, but we had a guy win MVP with stats and then they say he was stat padded. Like, <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's com- really confusing on um, the voting and and we don't really know what how people vote. So it's just, it could be personal who they like personally. Like, I just think it's, I think it's a little flawed. So you just never know. When it's so skewed like that, does it just become a popularity contest at that point? Like who, you, who, you know what? It's so close. I just like Jokic better. It, it, I mean, it's a popularity and, you know, familiar. I mean, you know, someone that sees a player, maybe he's on the West coast or he sees a certain player in person more than another player. Mm-hmm. He's going to have to, he's going to feel a certain way maybe about that guy. Or who talks to him more? Like, I don't know. That's just from a media standpoint. Um, You know, other players or whoever gets voted. I don't even know who does all the voting, but I'm just saying from a standpoint of it's so close. I think you got to really, really watch a lot of games to really get a feel for it. And I don't think, I don't know if that's the case. I don't, you know, I can't say I don't think. I just don't know if that's the case. If people are truly into right now with so many games, just watching those particular players each game and not necessarily a national TV game, but you got to really be digested into what they're doing because you can't just look at box scores and look at stats um, in this particular vote. Um, and I think when you're voting for your top five, it's, it's if, if, if winning matters, then, you know, a guy like Devin Booker should be in there. Yeah. If winning isn't as important as you is not that important. Then you'll pull somebody up and maybe just, you know, a six C, a six C with um, you, you know, six or seven C, with players out. Um, I don't know. Do you I, think I, winning I, I in the like past? Joe will get it, but I do not have a. Uh, I can't say I don't have a bad feeling, but I have a I don't know feeling. Do you think winning an MVP in the past works for or against you at all, or doesn't matter? Oh, I think it works against you. You think it works against you to have already have one? Yes, especially if you've only had, if you've had, um, in Yana's case, you've had multiple. And then Joe <clears> because if, if you can correct me if I'm right, but I believe Yana's numbers this year may even be better than they were previously. Yeah. Certain numbers are, certain numbers are, I believe his turnovers are up. I think his field, free throw percentage is up. I think his points are up. Yeah. So, so I mean, he in, in some ways, he's better. And, and if you, but if you watch him play, right, what you see with your eyes, you see a better player. Yeah. What I see, you know what I'm saying? So I see a better player now than then. Um, Is that, so, that would work for him though, right? Because you're like, oh, we gave it to him when he was I'm worked. just saying you would think it does. But the yeah. fact that he's sort of that MVP fatigue because he's already won, people, the hype isn't really there. Yeah. And, and and that's when you had, you know, Coach Malone talking about Jokic should be the clear MVP, but since he won MVP last year, nobody's not talking about it. That's sort of the MVP fatigue. So but should they should that be not and then a guy that like Jordan never won it? Should the hype be there? And yeah. and that's why it's 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 ch- kind of interesting that you don't like in the past, winning seemed to always be a part of it. A bigger part of it. Because it's not always the best player. It's just who was particularly that MVP that year, but it's maybe not the best particular player in the league or, you know, another player may be better, but who's most valuable? How you see it? Most valuable player to a team? Um, best player? What? What? what is, how, how would you vote? It's strange because Embiid and Jokic were it was pretty close last year. But the thing that they gave it to Jokic, and I remember hearing analysts, I don't know what they actually did in the end, but they said a lot of it was the amount of time Joel missed. That was like the biggest thing that worked against him. Jokic did it, but he's available yeah. every night. He's available every night. It, but that, that was the reason why I felt he wouldn't get it because of the time that he missed last year. 
but he's already played more games this year than he did last year, so he can scratch that off the list, yeah. right? So he played, and his stats are better. Like, he's yeah. up one rebound. He's up two points. He's up two assists. He has more steals and blocks. Same amount of turnovers and playing more minutes and playing every night. So if he improved, if a guy who almost won last year, who got rid of his own negative as, uh, aspect, which was games played, and he's up almost every single statistic, how, and he dealt with the Ben Simmons thing. Like, I, I just don't under, I mean, I, I, I'm probably thinking what he's thinking. It's like, I mean, dude, like what, what the hell can I do here? Like, I just don't, I don't get it. I don't think anyone else dealt with the amount of drama we dealt with as a team and he held it together yeah. and played even better. And we played almost just the same as we did last year, as far as our standing, we're right there. Um, and that stat that everyone keeps talking about with the 40 points and 10 rebound games, only two people in the history have done it more than him in the season, Moses Malone and Westbrook shocker. They both won MVP those years. Yeah. So it's just, yeah, man, it, it's, it's hard. I mean, as a Philly aspect, as what to what he's saying, I'm personally not a fan. I know, Marcus, you're not either. We're not a fan of all Philly sports. We're just Sixer fans. Um, don't hate us. But um, it, it's weird when you're a Sixer fan, you uh, you get exposed to a kind of like um, the overall Philly hate that, you know, the players and the fans feel like they get from national yeah. media and national fans. Um, so I, I do understand that a little bit. I feel that even though I'm not fully involved with the Philly sports, just Sixers. So maybe he's talking about that or, I mean, the process was hated by a lot of people. And a lot of those people do have votes. They, they, they always kind of like, you know, you know, he talks about it. Stan Van Gundy always talks about it, um, about being very anti the process. And you can still hear it in his voice. He's still very anti like us winning because it, it no one likes being wrong. Right. So if we ever do win with this current, you know, Embiid era, the process did work. And a lot of people have to eat crow and say, all right, I was wrong, but they don't want to do that. So yeah. I almost feel like a part of them wants to keep them, keep it down. Yeah, just I mean, so I they don't, don't have I don't, to. I mean, like with the process, I don't necessarily see it like that as far as the, the process, because I think that um, a lot was gained, but a lot was lost. Yeah. Um, you know, you, you, from that from that quote unquote process, who's left over? It's pretty much, I mean, Joel. Yeah, so he I is the process. <laughs> yeah, like so I, I think it's a totally different time with totally different players. I just think it was a situation to get picks, but most of those guys aren't there. Yeah. I think if Ben was still there, you can kind of say, Yeah, you got two all stars that are there, top picks, and you don't really get those consecutively like that. Um you can, I guess you can make an argument and say, Maxi, we got him through like process, you know, like trading in picks and whatnot. He kind of kind of came in, but he's not true. Yeah, I mean, but you can also see, I mean, well, he wasn't like a top pick. No, that's I mean, true. I think that when people are looking at that, they're looking at, you know, you, you're not going to tank for uh, a later pick. That's what I'm saying. Yes, yes. Sort true. of quote unquote tanking to get top picks and all of that. So who's left from that is just Joel. Yep. I mean, you had draft picks and stuff like that that you were able to move and get pieces, but um, I think the way they are now, that could have taken place without a lot of the quote-unquote process taking place. Yeah, I, and the process way of doing things is so accepted now. It's not what – I mean, it's crazy. You say times have changed in those, what, five, six, seven years. But look, I mean, Sam Presti's praised for doing the same thing the Sixers did, which is just – benching players who can help you win, get more picks and tank and take on bad contracts for money and picks. So a lot's changed in those years. Yeah. Collecting assets. <laughs> um, yeah. Um, uh, I was going to say one more thing about the whole MB situation. Um, yeah. Uh, I did want to ask this because I was watching undisputed um, and skip Bayless and Shan Sharp said that with Joel making those comments, that if he doesn't win, um, that the media hates him. Does that play? Does that work against him? They're saying he can kiss the MVP goodbye after saying a quote like that. Would that would that work against him in a way, or you don't think that would even oh, face? I, I don't think that. I don't think it helps people like him. Yeah. You know, I, I don't. I would think that they're professional enough to still do their job and and, and pick who they honestly think is the MVP. Um, but I don't think it necessarily helps them. Yeah, like Bill Simmons and Rosillo uh, were saying yesterday on their show that they can't stand the lobbying for 
votes, they think they, it, it totally works against them. It makes them not like the player. And they say pretty much, it's like telling me I'm an idiot. And say, I, I, yeah, I don't think I don't think it helps them at all. Yeah, it's like telling me I'm an idiot. And I don't know who to pick. Like I need you to tell me who to pick. I don't do it. It's not working. It's not helping you. Yeah. I don't know. I, I, I think, you know, it, it, talk about media. I, I think the media overall likes him. He's a fun guy. Everyone's always talking about anything he does, whether it's Twitter or in the past or anything. He's always a topic of some sort. They love him. He's more remarkable player than Jokic uh, and, and Giannis. I mean, he's got with the Hulu. He's got Coke commercials. He's got more. He's got more going on than the other guys do. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't say he is hated by the media. I, I think that's a different that's a, that's a, that's a different kind of narrative to, to, to put out there. So I hope yeah, he's hated by media. Yeah, I hope it's not impacting his vote. So we'll see. We we have we have a good stretch run of uh, of not the best teams but outside of Toronto. The, the teams we play over the next uh, four games aren't the best teams. So he could pad his stats and uh, get back up in that conversation, take out Jokic. Yep. So we'll, we'll see. But um, final topic tonight: game predictions. Uh, we have four games left. Um, the Sixers are still in between first place and fourth place right now. So we can we can kind of we we, we can pretty much create our own narrative based on how we uh, finish the season off here. So we could be a one seed, but in order to do that, we got to travel to Indiana tonight, to take on the Pacers. Pacers aren't uh, aren't world beaters by any means, but you know any given night. Now we're currently a twelve and a half point favorite going into Indiana. Um, who do you guys have and why tonight? I mean, I think we, we'll get the we'll get the win. Uh, I don't think we cover the spread. I think it'll be a, they'll play us closer and, you know, make some shots. You know, I think we'll pull out the victory. I just think that, like, you know, Joel and those guys and kind of feeling determined, we we keep our foot on the gas and we keep we keep winning. Um, but but I do not think it's going to be easy. Yeah, I I, told, I agree with that. I think uh, it's I looked at a bunch of the spreads today and a lot of the playoff versus non-playoff teams are like, huge i think brooklyn's like a 17 point favorite um and we're one of those double digit ones but we're one of the lower d- double digit ones i will say so maybe they're vegas is trying to entice you to take uh philly but um yeah i i think they'll keep it close i i think um i think we'll let them back in the game or they'll we'll keep it in that 8 to 12 range i think we win by like 9 10 um but i don't think we cover but i do think we win and hey i i hope we kill them get our guys some rest man like get them out of the game and let them you know, let MB get his stats and let, let them gel a little bit, but then, you know, take him out if you can and rest them. I mean, we need, to, we need to start thinking about that. Yeah. Especially with MB starting to get a lot of lower leg injuries and starting to kind of, you know, he he's leaning over a lot during games and holding the ankle. And, you know, I, I don't want him to, you know, step on a loose floorboard and you know, hurt his ankle or anything. Yeah. It's not going to wood for that. Um, but as you know me, I, I'll say buy points, take it minus five and a half. Not bad. Buy some points. <laughs> Buy some points, yeah. Um, yep, but that does it for us, guys. Thanks for tuning in to Believe in 76 which is presented by Bet Online. We'll see you guys on Friday as we talk about the remaining two games and also, obviously, where our seating is and uh, maybe uh, little predictions on the uh, the playing games that will take place from April 12th to April 15th before the first round begins. So, Ooh, boy, it's coming. We'll see you guys on Friday. Have a good night, guys. All right, guys. Thank you.